great. Hi, it's um, it's really an honor to be here. Um, my um, okay. Um, my talk today is uh, a little different than the other talks that have been here, um, but in general, um, part of what I was hoping to do when when I was invited here and what I was hoping to convince some people of is is two basic things. One is that this issue is very important, and the scale of the issue ensures that you are essentially impacted by it. That's the first point, I suppose. And the second point is that if you are inside of an organization like the NSA or NIST, that after watching this presentation, you will follow Edward Snowden's example. So um, we've been thinking about these issues for quite a long time. Uh, Julian and I wrote a book a number of years ago before Snowden called Cypherpunks. And I would really encourage you to download it. It's not exactly the finest piece of work or writing, but it sort of gives you an idea about the interrelationship between everything from Bitcoin and anonymity to mass surveillance. And we were talking about this obviously long before the book, um, but in the book we sort of talked about it in a way where if you read it in a historical frame, people that read this book thought, these guys, they're crazy paranoid. They're talking about entire countries' telephone systems being under surveillance. That's not possible. Totally ridiculous. And actually, at the time, we had documented proof. We had leaked information about AIMSYS and Libya, as an example, as part of the WikiLeaks spy files. And we'd actually shown exactly that it was happening. But people still didn't really internalize this knowledge and integrate it into their threat models, and they sort of refused it. And the amount of mockery that we received for some of the things we said in this book, which have been subsequently proven to be true by the Snowden revelations, um, I think it's, it's remarkable, and we should look to some of the things that are being said today that also seem similarly uh, ridiculous, but actually, if we do a little digging, we might find that there's some serious truth to them. Um, so that's the initial response, right? It's not happening. You're paranoid. There's no mass surveillance. But actually, it's significantly worse than we talked about in the book. Um, some of the systems, turmoil, for example, turbine, the rest of these very large planetary systems, wealthy cluster is another name. This is an ingest system, which does uh, really like extreme processing of data. Um, there are uh, systems that are capable of uh, gathering a billion simultaneous um, transactions right real time, all the time. And they're deployed all over the whole planet. Um, and there's, I mean, there's, there are systems that are so ridiculous that it's, it, it sort of defies imagination. I'll give you a good example. Who here has ever used a satellite telephone? Anyone? One, one person? You guys got to get out more. Um, but uh, a satellite telephone, obviously it makes sense how it works, right? You have like a bird in the sky and you have a radio transmitter and you talk to this bird in the sky. Um, we think, but we're not sure, the National Reconnaissance uh, Office has another satellite actually directly behind the Thoraya satellite, which is a very well-known Airbrun satellite. So if you imagine that, you have Earth and you have a satellite and people make phone calls and it's relayed back down to the ground station. And then behind that, there's a gigantic listening device. And you can see it just when the sun comes up. You can see the streak of the two objects in space. And there's a photographer, Trevor Paglin, who has taken a photograph of the two objects. One is a registered satellite, one is the Raya. What's the one behind it? It's like a giant ear to catch signal bleed. So when we think about the budgets here, consider that that is just one project. There's lots of projects like that. So we really are talking not just planetary scale, but off the planet as well. I mean, it's really kind of amazing. So when we think about that, that's attack budget. We're talking billions of dollars on attack. I mean. In a community that has less than a thousand people that have published more than three papers, according to um, I think it was Phil Rogaway who who said that, um, gives you an idea about the scale of the economics that are at play. So this underplays it to say you know at scale surveillance, really really amazing scale, um, and. We hear some of the lamest rhetoric, I think, that is possible. Who, has anyone ever heard this in public, like in the news, for example? You know, you've got to help us or the terrorists win. One of the big lies of the mass surveillance debate is that if we have mass surveillance, if we have sabotage systems, we'll be a lot safer. Um, and in, in fact, General Alexander, who was the head of the NSA for, I think, one of the longest periods of any particular leader of the NSA, um, he sort of says, you know, in Iraq, we went from a response time of 19 hours to nine minutes, and that like helped save lives. This is an important point, 
But what he's sort of saying at the same time is that the 100,000 to a million Iraqi lives that were taken, he wasn't talking about saving those lives, right? So there's human beings and then there are Muslims. That's kind of how he implies it. Now, he doesn't say it exactly like that, but that is the subtext. There are people and then there are enemies. Enemies don't have human rights. Enemies get to get the ax. And so nobody directly says that, but the actions the things that they actually carry out with these systems. It's not that by having mass surveillance, we actually eliminate killing. That's not what's happening here. It's just different people getting killed. And so the big, big, big framing issue here is that it's terrorism or mass surveillance. And if we have mass surveillance, there's no more terrorism. This is, of course, a lie, but most people don't confront that and they don't talk about it in terms of raw numbers. It's just dishonest, actually. Um, and the worst lie that I can see is the Information Assurance Directorate of the NSA. And the reason that it's the worst lie is because they give a thin veneer of respectability to the National Security Agency, whose job is to do everything but information assurance. Now, I'm sorry to the NSA people in the room. Uh, I'm sure you're actually really wonderful people. I mean, you know, and just following orders, I think is the phrase. But even if you are doing a good job, there's a reason you're allowed to do that job. It's a big system, and in that system, if you're doing a thing that is approved of, there's something to be said about why it is you're allowed to do that and who it is you're actually impacting. So I think there are people who are being, unfortunately, misled about what it is that they are uh, doing. And in the offhand chance, they are being helpful. The problem is they're not actually being helpful to everyone on a big scale, and they may actually be harmful on a big scale. So for example, when IAD people are auditing SCADA systems or they're finding critical vulnerabilities in critical infrastructure, that's a great thing. We want defensive things like that to take place. When we have a power plant that can be hacked by the Chinese, the Russians, the Americans, the Germans, whoever, that's a problem. It's a, it can be an environmental disaster. We want to stop that. But when these guys find bugs, there's no guarantee that the tailored access and operations division does not take those bugs and then use them against someone else's power plants. In fact, it's in their purview to do exactly that. So when these guys are doing their job, they actually help the other side of the same organization to subvert and to harm not only economic and political concerns, but potentially even environmental concerns. <clears throat> so we should just dismiss that. Those people, unfortunately, are either useful idiots or, quite frankly, saboteurs. OK, and who here has not said something like this? We've all seen these things, right? But what we see here, which I think is, is this a laser pointer? I feel like it's a laser pointer. This one's great. It, the framing of the I have nothing to hide is fundamentally a misframing. Every single person in this room is wearing clothes. That's not because you have something to hide. It's because you wish to have agency over whether or not you take those clothes off yourself. It is about your choice. This is fundamentally about liberty. That is your own personal dignity. It is not at all having something to hide. Now, having something to hide may also be true, but that's, it's really separate, in my opinion. And of course, there's, as cryptographers, you probably are like horrified by this one, the golden key one. Um, I mean, it's just embarrassing. It's like the people that tie something on their car to the back wheel axle because they don't understand how the whole system works together. And then they try to drive their car with something tied to the top of it and the car doesn't move, right? So people that are doing this in the policy debate are especially very scary. Um, and this one is, really like the one that I'm the most apologetic about. Um, you know, well, they don't spy on Americans. Like, raise your hand if you're an American, right? We've got a couple, okay. So I would say the majority of my friends across the world, across my life are Americans. But the majority of my friends who are not Americans, I can't look at them and, and tell them, sorry, you're worth less than this other person. And the whole notion of universal human rights is this notion that we have a universality of humanity, actually. And so this, this notion about not spying on Americans is suggesting that human rights only apply to a small set of people um, based on where they accidentally were born, basically. And I think that that is actually a travesty. It sort of undoes some of the great work done in the 20th century against tyranny, where people really gave a great deal of thought to the kind of world they wanted to create, where they created the European Court of Human Rights, where they said states have limits and states can be wrong. And so when we see this, we don't spy on Americans, as an American, I especially want to apologize to all the non-Americans because this is a discriminatory practice, not only in law, but actually in people's minds where people are less than others. Um, and this right here, the unsurprised one, I, I think it's important to under, 
understand what this is. That's a coping mechanism. That's people saying like, well, I can't do anything about it. And like, of course, you know, spies are gonna spy. That frame of reference is a little bit like, well, drone killers, killers are gonna kill. But is that the world we want to live in? The question we have to ask ourselves is, is this the end of the discussion? And I feel like if the answer is yes, that's fantastic for you, but I'd really hope that you're not the last person talking about it. That to me is a little scary. Um, so obviously, as the previous talk discussed, we've seen you know, from multiple years, basically, we had governments denying that it was happening. For example, in Juul v. NSA, which is a case about domestic American surveillance. So this is a question which most of the NSA people that I know, and I know a lot of NSA people, um, they, they were less horrified about everyone else in this room being targeted for surveillance. They were really horrified to find out that at 2nd and Folsom Street in San Francisco, in California, that the NSA was doing bulk internet collection. Now that's part of a program called Fairview, which has not been fully disclosed. It's part of a special source operations program, which I think in the future, we'll see some documents about that. Um, but the main thing is that they were really, really unhappy to find out that Americans were being spied on in bulk, in wholesale. I actually believe that I was targeted by exactly that system. I used to live in that city and I had some experiences that were related to data that transited through that interception point. So I very personally am upset about this, but not because I don't care about anybody else around the world, but in particular because that was without a doubt illegal. And in fact, there was a reauthorization process in the US where the attorney general and some other people really had quite a fight about this because it was blatantly unconstitutional. Um, but in NSA versus Juul in this court case, they basically keep saying, oh, there's no proof, state secret, state secret. So it turns out what we needed, Julian Assange really sort of put into the minds of people in the last 10 years, we need primary source documents written by the people committing these crimes. And it turns out that's exactly what Snowden brought down. And that changes the discussion, as I wrote on this slide, sorry to read my slide, this changes the discussion entirely. It changes it from, it's not happening and we can't talk about it for reasons of national security to, you know, General Alexander, James Clapper, they lied before Congress under oath and they weren't prosecuted for it, which shows us that there's a degradation of the rule of law because if I lie before Congress under oath, I go to prison. And if they do it, nothing happens to them. And that's exactly what has happened to this day. They have not. So in uh, a couple of years ago, before Edward Snowden came out, I actually showed uh, and discussed General Alexander basically lying before Congress. And I said, he's a liar, we're gonna prove it. And then Edward Snowden actually made that possible. I didn't know that at the time, so it was a really good bet. Um, but uh, it's important to note that the difference between what I was saying then and what I'm saying now is that Snowden came along with documents that proved that he was lying and that there's a domestic interception program that basically has interception points running in all of the 50 United States and with AT&T in almost all of the 50 states. AT&T is the Fairview program, just for the record. Um, and some of the things we hear in public are embarrassing. I won't actually read all of these. I'll put these slides up later, but this one's fantastic. Um, they don't do signals intelligence collection in any country or anywhere in the world unless it's necessary to advance national security, foreign policy interests, and of course to protect citizens and the citizens of its allies and partners from harm. So if you're like from a country where that's, it doesn't apply to you, sorry, you're, you're out. And uh, of course, you know, what does foreign policy interests mean? You know, whenever they feel like it. That's what it means. It means whenever they feel like it. That's how you can unpack that statement. I've dealt with Vanny Vines quite a lot. I feel like she might be an artificial intelligence. I'm not sure. She basically says the same five things over and over again. Um, she also has the worst job I can imagine. I actually feel very bad for that artificial intelligence, right? Machines are people too. And um, I mean, in all seriousness, she, she really has the worst job I can imagine. She has to defend the NSA against the undefensible thing, which is that they got caught. I mean, it's really embarrassing for them. Um, but I'm sure she actually has her heart in the right place. And she, like a lot of people, really believes in the mission. It's very clear uh, that she does believe in the mission. And it's kind of, as an American, I kind of understand that. There's a part of me that's like, yeah, I believe in the mission too. But then there's a part of me that thinks, you know, you guys, you got caught. Just like fess up, fix it, it's time to move on. Continuing to deny it like this is not helping the debate. It's actually embarrassing, right? It undermines trust in the government. The, uh, the head of the FBI, James Comey, um, he is also really embarrassing in a number of ways. And he, he, of course, says something like, you know, there's a misconception that building a lawful intercept solution into a system requires a so-called backdoor, one that foreign adversaries and hackers may try to exploit. 
That's a really interesting statement. You can read the rest of it if you want to. But the basic notion is that like there's a misconception that you know this back door, yeah, it's gonna it might be exploited by people. Well, so it's funny because he actually knows that that is the case. He knows that for sure. Um, part of the reason is because the NSA and the FBI actually break into lawful intercept solutions that are deployed all around the world. And in some cases, the Cisco router that you buy that shipped out of the United States, as the previous speaker mentioned, as disclosed by Glenn Greenwald in his book, No Place to Hide, they actually tamper with, at what are called load stations, the devices which are running non-free proprietary software that you can't verify. And then they simply change either the hardware or the software. And some of the hardware implants, I mean, you've got to give you know, my hats off to some of the people that work at this place. I mean, they're like really, really, they've got a lot of money and they're very mediocre. They can really absolutely deliver a minimal viable product. And it's really impressive, actually, with how much money they're spending about that. I mean, it's really like it's really something. Um, but for example, they do full content collection on all of the phone calls for the Bahamas. Every time you make a phone call in the Bahamas, full content of the call is recorded with the NSA. And they do it under the auspices of lawful interception. So now we have to ask ourselves, why is James Comey lying? And the reason is because they use this data in an illegal process, which is called parallel construction, where the intelligence service passes to law enforcement information gained in an illegal manner that should not be admissible in a court, and then they use it in a court to convict people. That's called the SOD, the Special Operations Division, which is part of the, the, the Drug Enforcement Agency. And they're actually knowingly lying to prosecutors about these things. So this statement is motivated, in fact, by what we could just call straight up corruption. Right. And of course, there are some other people that have said some other ridiculous things. This one is my favorite when The Washington Post says we should invent a kind of secure golden key that would retain and use only when a court has approved a search warrant. I mean, this is like I mean, it's not that we can't build crypto key escrow crypto. I mean, of course you can do that. It's technically possible to do it. It's just that you can't make the same security guarantees. And you have really big problems with what we could call, you know, forward policy secrecy, if you want. Uh, or, you know, no key erasure, if you want. Um, and it's, yeah, it doesn't pass the giggle test. And, and then recently, Mike Rogers, who's now the head of the NSA, he had a little debate with the chief security officer of Yahoo. And, and, and the chief security uh, officer of Yahoo, his name is Alex Stamos. And he's a very respectable, really, really good security person. Really, really talented, very smart. And he just asked the most obvious question. So let's say we build in these back doors. Do I give the backdoor access to the Chinese government, to the Russian government? When we build systems that are not secure and we have knowingly weakened them because of political considerations, um, what stops those countries from taking the key? In the case of, for example, Google, the Chinese under the program Aurora broke into Google and got access to, according to the Washington Post in 2010, their uh, foreign intelligence service court ordered, oh, that's a secret court, by the way, um, got access to the list of targets. So the Chinese government, they have a list of the targets. The American government has it, Google has it, but the rest of us don't. Somehow that's not in balance, or as we might say, it's not necessary and proportionate. It may be useful to do surveillance that way. It may be useful to like have that thing, but when we trust corporations to have that surveillance data, what happens? And when we add a back door, what happens if you get someone who's like Edward Snowden, except without any good intentions at all? I mean, the history of spies is that they turn and that they go and work for someone else. It's very rare in history that you have a Daniel Ellsberg, a Chelsea Manning, or an Edward Snowden who tells the world what they've seen. Usually people sell those secrets. And so what happens when the secrets they sell literally are the, the, the private key for dual EC DRBG, for example? That's a really problematic thing. And how will we know when that's being exploited? Most recently, we saw that the NSA and the GCHQ went after Gemalto, stealing all the secret keys that they possibly could so that they could do OTA updates on phones and push out malware. That's very problematic. We also see, for example, that they went after Belgacom, breaking into the core telephone infrastructure of Belgium, which is a European Union country. So the UK doing that, it's clearly a violation of the European Commission's charters. It's completely illegal. So if they're doing that and they know that, how can this be a good design? This is very dangerous. It's very short term. It's, a, it's, it's basically hoping you know, that we can put the genie back in the bottle. David Cameron, also just completely embarrassing. I mean, he was embarrassing before he said this, but this is really embarrassing. Um, it's like, we don't want terrorists to have a safe space to communicate with each other. You know, his soldiers in Iraq are terrorists to somebody else. 
So what he's really saying is no safe space on the internet, no private space. But the right to form and to hold an opinion is one of the very few rights that is without actual interference allowed in any way. So you're not allowed to interfere with a person's right to hold and to form an opinion. You can abridge their freedom of speech, which is a separate right, but freedom of expression and the right to hold and form an opinion are two separate rights. Um, this is currently something the Special Rapporteur uh, on Freedom of Expression in the United Nations is working on, and I think it's really, uh, it's very good. I had the opportunity to participate in that. And one of the things is that all people, no matter what you might call them without a trial, all people have a right to a safe space, actually, all people. And terrorism is a pejorative term that we have to deconstruct as a narrative because the reality is when you're not an American, you're a suspected terrorist. If you just happen to be in the wrong place or if you're brown or if you happen to have a cell phone you bought at a market, right? So that's, I mean, it's just important to note, you are a terrorist to somebody else, especially if you didn't raise your hand when I asked if you were an American. And especially if you work on crypto because there is so much power in the crypto community I mean, Obama himself is probably the sole dissenter of this, which I think is pretty fascinating. I mean, I'm not a super big fan of Mr. Drone assassination, but I, I do believe that he has a lot of knowledge. He's a strong believer in encryption. Sounds good. What does he know that we don't, though, when he says that? I'm very curious. Um, and one of the most disappointing interactions I've had lately about this is from uh, an academic that I really respect, Steve Bellivan. He says, spy's gonna spy. This kind of reductionist coping mechanism, I think, is very dangerous, and we have to avoid falling into that trap. Yeah, spies are going to spy, but let's build systems that resist the 190 other countries in the world that have spies. That would be a really good thing. It has economic benefits. It has human rights benefits. It's very clear. So when we see stuff like this, what I wish that he had said is, as an American, I'm deeply ashamed and embarrassed, not only that we got caught, but that we did it at all. He didn't. Um, and the authorities are very clear. They want to sabotage everything. So I'll just, I'll speed this up a little bit. Um, has everyone here heard of Bull Run? Or has anyone here not heard of Bull Run? Would be a better question. Okay, so Bull Run is amazing. It is a program which, at least in the United Kingdom, a thousand people as of 2010 were read into this program. That means that a thousand people knew the full details or most of the compartments that are inside. So in an intelligence organization, you have a clearance and you have different compartments and you get cleared for different compartments and you know about one program, but you might not know about all the other programs related to it. So Bull Run is one of the most secret of secret things. And basically it undermines encryption. Their goal as part of the Bull Run program is to influence standards bodies. That means, and I'll, and I'll get back to this in a bit, to influence standards to make sure that they are weakened, right? It is to harm the capabilities of people working in those communities it is to actually change the hardware underneath. It's basically, imagine all of the ways you can attack a system, do all of that, and then attack the people building the systems. And it's really like hundreds of millions of dollars. A thousand people in the UK as of 2010, and presumably a lot more on the NSA side. So we're talking thousands of people. How many of those people know the secret? And which one of those people can you trust to never ever tell all the details? Which one of those people has access to keys like, that are escrowed? One of the most horrible aspects of this is that they have critical infrastructure decryption capabilities. For example, there's a database called Caprios, which stores SSH traffic. Any of you ever use SSH? No? Okay. Any of you use a VPN? Yeah? Okay. Any of you use TLS? You ever log into a bank? Right. Okay. So the point is that if you didn't raise your hand, you're just a liar or you're just being quiet, and I respect that. But uh, the important point is, all those systems are impacted. They intentionally sabotage those systems to be able to capture the data from the mass surveillance system and to do decryption. Critical infrastructure like SSH, of course, would escape their gaze, but you, you know, we need that to actually be able to administer, for example, a hospital, a hospital network. Why do we need a back door in a hospital network? And of course, they are doing this decryption and they're keeping it to themselves. And that to me is very scary. It's not just that they're exploiting the Debian random number generator. They are very clear about the fact that they have different capabilities that are sustained against many different systems where they've sabotaged hardware devices for doing this. I, I suppose, but I don't know for sure. Cavium is mentioned a lot in these documents. You know, how could you build a backdoor if the Cavium hardware is bad? What could you do with that? This is an area of research that I think we need to look at and we need to find the people that did that and we should prosecute them. Um, 
and also this whole notion that they're going dark, you know, that they've got to see everything, they have to have access to everything, and terrorists are winning, and so on. It's basically a lie. Because of the Bull Run program, what we know is that they were running a psychological operation on the public. They were saying, we can't see everything, we're losing access to everything, but actually it was the exact opposite. And the NSA and the FBI do, along with the CIA, have access to the plain text of almost everything that was flowing across the internet. I mean, there are very few exceptions, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, but the most important thing is to counteract that, that list that I mentioned and to recognize this fact. We have the ability to change these issues, and we will, right? We'll break the ciphers that are backdoored. We'll embarrass the authors that shame the community, and we will find the people that are harming. It just takes time, but on the long scale, those people will lose. Um, but I wanted to very quickly sort of give you a pessimistic diagram here. And I was just trying to teach myself a little bit about tech. So I just thought it would be really fun to like draw, draw a pyramid so I couldn't resist. Um, when you choose surveillance, data retention, targeted uh, assassinations, whatever, you're actually choosing to buy into what I would consider to be sort of like the surveillance dystopian version of Maslow's hierarchy. You're on the bottom and these guys they decide what kind of life you want to live, what kind of information assurance you're going to have, what kind of actual uh, confidentiality, integrity, authenticity. They get to make these decisions. The NSA funds the GCHQ. That, in turn, goes for the Canadian, the Kiwi, and the Australians. And, you know, here in Turkey, you're over here. Right? You're here. Um, I'm over here. You're over here. Me? You. Um, just to give you an idea. So when, for example, when the Turkish government says they want to do lawful interception, here's the thing. They're about here. Because their lawful interception systems will almost certainly not be produced by them. They're going to buy a network switch from the United States or from China, and they're going to get from that the back doors that come with that. They don't control the means of production. Therefore, they don't control the actual power behind the device. And as a result, when you backdoor your network, you actually are giving, almost certainly, access to someone who has a bug database, even if they didn't backdoor it on purpose. A Huawei router is a real piece of junk. You put that in, backdoor or no backdoor, somebody else is going to get in. Cisco is a little bit better in that it's not you know, intentionally, uh, let's say, uh, full of bugs. They just built an interface for backdooring it. So it's somehow better engineered. You won't notice that it's been exploited. It'll be more stable. I'm not sure that that's better, but when the Turkish government decides to move into the surveillance realm, they're actually kind of participating in a kind of neo-colonialism where the power structure is inviting in another power structure to help them guard against their population. Maybe I'm going to get in trouble for saying this here, but you know, whatever, competitive authoritarianism. Um, this is really scary though. So every time you choose data retention, you say, well, a lawful court in Germany, for example, will go and grab that data. Well, the NSA doesn't care at all about your laws, so they just go and grab it. And they do, and they do that all over the place. And the same is true in each of these places. And they've committed major criminal acts internationally across the board. So I think, for example, we should probably find the people that work for these organizations when they set foot in countries like this one and in the EU, and we should arrest them. They're part of a criminal conspiracy. Put them in jail. So you can see this stuff online. But the important point here is it's not just NSA and CIA, right? The FSB, one of the most disgusting intelligence agencies on the planet, after the CIA, of course, it's kind of like a tough call, you know, one bag of dog shit, one bag of dog shit. It's like really bad, right? The CIA has a, a long history of really interfering with a lot of awful stuff, screwing up countries. They've most recently actually talked a great deal about how their interventions have not worked out. They've recently released some reports about that. I think it's pretty fascinating reading. Um, but there's no difference between these, right? The FSB has SORM which is the equivalent of Kalia. It gives them access, they're able to do surveillance, they're able to do lots and lots of nasty stuff in real time, collect data, and they use that to inject stuff and so on. They're kind of the low rent version of the NSA. Right? The NSA has planetary systems like Turmoil, Turbine, Wealthy Cluster, X Key Score, and so on. And FSB has SORM, they have some other stuff, but ultimately when we build systems that fall over for the NSA, we also build systems that probably, and in some cases certainly, fall over for those guys too. So if you had to choose between the two, I think I can understand why some people would choose the CIA. Not my choice, I'm not really thrilled about that. I'd like to choose a world where we don't give either of those groups an advantage on the internet because they're both very dangerous and anti-democratic. Um, 
And when we choose that unfair structure, sorry to read my slide again, we really seal our fate. The, the, the internet itself is a really amazing thing. And when we backdoor it and tamper with it, we lose the good properties of the internet in a really serious way. Um, and you see it in like, again, a very low rent way. Like the censorship in Turkey is pretty lame. And at the same time, you see that during Gezi Park, for example, that was good enough. And that's really dangerous. It's extremely dangerous to do that. What happens when another country decides that something you have done in Turkey is the equivalent of Gezi Park in their backyard, and they decide to take your equipment and turn it against the whole country? When you put those back doors in, you're probably giving someone else that power over you. I mean, it's a classic you know, discussion on colonialism, I suppose, um, but I'm glossing over a lot of the economic and social issues that are inherent in a colonialist structure. But this neo-colonialist, digitalist colonialism, if you could call it that, I think is really dangerous. We're just at the beginning of it. Um, so these, this set of tools right here is incredible. This is passive optical. Uh, turbine is active, so for injection. Um, the turbulence architecture is essentially for controlling mass surveillance exploitation devices. So, for example, they have back doors that are built all across the planet. They inject them, like sending academics CDs that when you put in your computer, now your computer has been infected. And they use the passive active collection systems to be able not only to control, but to exfiltrate data. They don't need to have a server to send the data to. They just have to broadcast it out to the Internet and have a passive optical system pick it up off the wire. That's really powerful. That allows for kind of, let's call them cyber operations that like make the Chinese, as they've been doing it, really like it's a joke. The Russian business network, a joke. There's like really incredible militarization going on here. X key score is amazing. It allows you to do flow analysis. It allows you to do protocol analysis in real time. And in the case of the United Kingdom, they have a, a deployment of X key score called, um, oh, it's, uh, Slipping my mind right now. What's the name of the, the British one? Tempora. Tempora, that's right. Thank you very much. Um, the Tempora system is an instance which has a buffer of all of the British internet traffic, all of it, that they can access at the borders and even inside of the country, just stored. And they can query it. So like 90 days of metadata and I think a week of full content or something like that, at least. That is amazing what we're talking, phone calls, web browsing, chat history, videos, whatever. They do some reduction to get rid of duplicate things. BitTorrent, for example, seems to be a really interesting protocol for making sure that it gets dropped because there's just so much BitTorrent. Um, but for everything else, they store it. And then they have what's called uh, um, a selection process. The selection process is this lie of targeted surveillance because first they illegally seize all of the data and then they do some searching. So it's like the opposite of a particularized specific warrant wherein they have a specific thing they're looking for and then they look only at that thing to find the thing inside of it. It's the exact bizarro world opposite of that, um, which is very dangerous, but that's what I would expect in the United Kingdom. There's a reason we shot the British and started America and it still exists. So the sad part though is X key scores deployed all over the place. I mean, fundamentally as an American, I'm really horrified by this, but I'm especially horrified by the fact that this system was used to target me. So it targeted one of my computer systems, which is a Tor directory authority. And we published the source code. Super proud publishing source code of the NSA. Take that, guys. And uh, I showed that I was one of the systems that was being monitored. Showed that the Tor network itself is being monitored. That, to me, is really scary stuff. Because there, there becomes a question in the digital world that's a philosophical one. For example, there's a Tor developer. His product, the Tor browser, is targeted. They call him a worthy adversary. They monitored a number of his systems and they wrote exploits for, for Tor browser to try to get, get at him. I mean, really like everything. And I said, you know, dude, they're after you. And he's like, no, 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 it's just my computer systems, the software that I write and they think that I'm a worthy adversary, but they're not after me. Well, what are you? Except on the internet, those things. Right, when he types his email address into a system, there's probably what's called a selector. And they have a thing which is called, uh, let's, let's call it persona session collection in one parlance. Persona session collection is the difference between wiretapping, which we think of as somehow reasonable, which it's often not, and whole life monitoring. Every unique identifier that is associated with you can get put into a system like X Keyscore, and the data that it sees that is related to those unique identifiers is promoted into what's called a corporate repository, which is then stored indefinitely. So that temporary buffer is used to more effectively search. 
And this allows you to write like C++ or Python or whatever to search through data and to extract the data and then to store it. And they have crazy storage capabilities. Um, but power, space, and cooling are their main uh, limitation. So one thing we can think about when we build network protocols is how to make it so that power, space, and cooling concerns will really screw up their collection. And we should. We have to design protocols in a way that really fuck up their day. And quantum is where they inject into the network. I think I just lost the... There we go. But um, quantum is where they inject into the network. So they use this passive collection to see like a TCP sequence number, and then they actually bounce through like your home router if they've compromised it. If it's closer to the target they want to attack, they'll send it the data and then they'll reflect it from that. So when you go to LinkedIn, they'll beat the race condition from a server that's in America from a DSL modem in Spain. The, that system is called the diode in this parlance. That's part of the, the sort of like turbine, turbulence, turmoil, and quantum is like different insta instantiations of that. Um, so this is a man on the side attack. We should never have a protocol that is vulnerable to a man on the side attack. It's just like a pathetic thing that that even works at all. I mean, it's very low rent. That's the kind of like Airpone was doing that 10 years ago at the DEF CON hacker community, and we haven't fixed it since. Um, but when you combine that with bull run, it becomes really scary. They do decryption and re-injection for traffic analysis. And then they run these tools over the decrypted data because they backdoored the crypto. Um, so, here, here's where I apply some pressure. So who stands behind us in this total surveillance system? You. Sorry to put the burden on you, but there are very few people in the world that actually can help build defenses against this. There's, I'd say, somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 really super skilled people that can do this kind of defensive work. And some of them, an unknown number of them, are actually infiltrating agents specifically sent here to undermine us in doing that, which really sucks. But openness and transparency can be used to fight that. Um, and why is that? And the answer is this. Fundamentally, what the previous speaker said is solid. Factoring, as far as we can tell, with regard to how RSA is implemented in PGP, actually stops these guys. Right? It's, it is the case that that's a hard problem. Discrete log is a hard problem for them. So for example, OTR and PGP and a few other programs, they specifically cannot deliver the plain text to their so-called customers. Um, obviously, there is a political role here. One thing that really changed the debate was when I revealed that Chancellor Merkel was spied on by the NSA. I also later got to ask General Alexander if he was embarrassed that I caught him, and he got really mad and he said, don't you think she's a legitimate target? And I said, well, now that you've confirmed once again that I caught you, I'm just curious, like, if you're embarrassed. Because it's really embarrassing to me that you're the best we've got and you got caught, but also that you're doing it at all. It just seems irrelevant and the costs are totally wrong. The, the cost to that, to societies, in fact, are totally wrong. Um, and of course, this is the other important thing. A lot of people are saying, well, you just can't win against an intelligence agency. That's not true. You can win against an intelligence agency. You just have to take a multi-pronged approach. We need the technology, but we need the political side. We need the cultural side as well. The way we win is by changing the entire social context and by not compromising on the fundamental scientific basis which is the math, and that is useful. And remember, the important part about this, the most important part about the math, is that the genie's out of the bottle. Other people will have this protection, other than the group that you identify with. So do we want to build an internet where protection is not allowed? What kind of world does that build when your country is not in charge? I mean, as the Chinese government comes to power in, in the world, I especially think the United States will regret the decision to sabotage the internet. Because once we are not on top of that pyramid anymore, justice is no longer guaranteed for anybody, actually. And it was never guaranteed for anybody else anyway. So with the open internet, we can change that, I think, a little bit. But the NSA and other groups like the CIA have really been harming that. Um, here's something I wanted to show. For those of you with the clearance, have fun disclosing that in your uh, country report. That's actually a, a top secret from FISA Intercept. We published it in Der Spiegel. Um, and it's basically the uh, cryptographic exploitation services uh, saying, sorry, can't decrypt this OTR message. We've got tons of those. And they have plain text, and then in some cases they're like, sorry, can't decrypt OTR. So they deliver the final product to the FBI, and they cannot decrypt it. That means that discrete log means that the, the Diffie-Hellman, the DSA, the AES that's being used, the particular composition is safe, or it was safe during the time of that intercept. 
Here's another really fantastic classified document. I left the classification on there just so it was undeniable. Um, this is great. This is my favorite slide of all time for a number of reasons, um, with regard to crypto anyway. There's a couple really, really great classified documents that are not slides, but um, they basically say like, you know, in 2012, what's the impact, who's using it? And I was a little sad as a person that works on tour, though I'm not here in my tour capacity. I was a little sad that they say current high priority target use and catastrophic near total loss slash lack of insight to target communications and presence. I was a little sad Tor was in that category, but like not super sad because then I remember that I'm in that category. So fuck you guys. It's really, really frustrating to me that that's the case, right? This is where Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, this is where people who work on crypto, this is where we are right here. Probably a majority of people in this room are in that quadrant. And over here, we have people who are not being targeted at all, and it also is catastrophic to their surveillance. Uh, basically, that to me is really fantastic. It's very uplifting. We have at least good things in both categories. So if you have an iPhone, you can install a piece of software called Signal, which is essentially an end-to-end -end encrypted voice over IP system, which you can verify the keys on both sides in a real-time, in a usable way, and that is, without a doubt, fantastic. It also allows you to send texts and pictures and it uses the data plan and you don't need a login and password. It's all done with keys. Uh, it's free software so you can verify that it does what it says it does. It's openly specified. It's real great. And it was Redphone. It still is on Android. It's Redphone and Tech Secure. And on iOS, it's called Signal and they're uh, platform compatible, cross-platform uh, cross compatible. Um, so that's great. It's fantastic, actually. This also works. You can use the Tor network. You can use Tails, which is a, a bootable live CD. And of course you can use TrueCrypt. That's a very important, I think just an important point, which is that they're really saying this crypto, these protocols, they really are screwing up our day. So if you as cryptographers especially can help with these projects, it will make a huge impact. Help find the vulnerabilities, help improve the pieces of software, because this is one of the things that is in, a, in an alignment, it's really helping us. Um, you'll note Skype is not on that list. And the reason is because they have been lying about Skype for many years. We published also in December the Skype interception documents that specifically show that that's the case. So they are lying. Everybody that said they couldn't capture Skype is lying or more importantly, they were not read into the program and they're irrelevant, what they think is irrelevant to that. Um, and this is probably for you guys, probably the most chilling thing and I'm sorry to deliver it, but there is in the black budget, which is a fantastic document. I hope someday in the future, you'll be able to read all of it. And uh, basically they, they actually talk, we published this in December too, about sending NSA people to the IETF to sort of you know work on VoIP standards to make sure that collection would be possible to be able to help. So they go to open meetings to subvert the standards, right? It's really time to clean house about these kinds of people doing these kinds of things. It's really concerning to have that. This notion that machine-to-machine -machine communication is not important is, to me, very terrifying. Most of the time, your phone makes machine-to-machine -machine communications. You very rarely have communications from your phone that are intentional communications. So Signal helps you with an intentional communication. But your phone talks to the tower all the time, and all that crypto is broken by design. All of it. Every time you see a cipher deployed somewhere, like in a commercial network, you've got to ask yourself, what's wrong with it? And the answer is probably not nothing. Um, so, as I said, do we really want to endorse or review the standards of a bad actor? Or, in the case of some of the people at NIST, a good actor who has been fooled? I mean, I think the answer is no. We, we don't want to do that. Um, if you want to see the best example and explanation of this, and I'm not saying this just because I like the people that made this web page, um, projectbullrun.org slash dual dash ec slash index.html it, it goes over the dual EC DRBG, which as far as I can tell is exactly as we understand it in public. RSA was bribed, corruption. Dual EC DRBG was backdoored, corruption, sabotage. And it's all documented right here as much as is possible. And NIST, the witting or unwitting fool. Um, so as they say in America, teach the controversy. Um, this is a, an important detail. I've heard that John Kelsey from NIST I've actually never met him in person, but I've heard a great deal about him. Seems like a really great guy. Hey, if you're watching this video, super sorry if I make you feel uncomfortable. Um, I've heard he said he's sorry. 
So as a political consideration, I really hope that NIST will declare that what Edward Snowden has helped to reveal by leaking these documents, by whistleblowing, is in fact that they helped to set straight a mistake that NIST made. And I hope that all of you will take two minutes out of your day in the next couple of days to write to NIST and ask them as members of the crypto community to in fact say thanks in public to a person who's been granted political asylum in a repressive regime, unfortunately, because of revealing this. We should be able to trust our standards bodies. We should be able to know that like the atomic weight of something is as they say it is and not to the benefit of some cronies inside of the government that benefit from a lie. We should be able to know what time it is. We should be able to make objective assertions about reality and trust the standards bodies so we don't have to rewrite everything from first principles and retest it all. Um, so for that, I really think we need a truth and reconciliation process, which is a little heavy handed in what, it's, what I'm claiming, but I think that without that, it's really problematic. Um, and I, I say this with all due respect, but there are a lot of open questions and NIST is really tainted by this. And I'm, I'm very sad actually about this because NIST is sort of in my mind as a child growing up, NIST and NASA are like the two great, like two of the great examples of American government institutions that are really hard to have an issue with, right? Traveling in space for all of humanity, you know, landing on the moon, et cetera. It's incredible, the Voyager space probe with the golden records. And you have these standards bodies that help enable that. Imagine my sadness when I learned that NASA was mostly military actually, and that NIST lies to us. It's really very corrosive. Um, but the important point is that the processes are what are the problem. We need to improve the processes because here's the question. What happens when the Russians and the Chinese do the same thing to NIST? That's a really big problem. And what happens when the FBI and the NSA and the CIA don't notice and they don't correct it? The, the real problem is the processes. It's not even the NSA and the CIA influencing standards, although it is also that. The real problem is that the process itself is vulnerable to this and that we don't have rigorous processes that ensure that these things don't happen openly and transparently and that they're not proactively doing it. The community has to push them. You know, I'm really surprised that that's the case. I really would expect that respectable people would really like throw a fit about these things, go to the relevant government bodies and really push for transparency, give everything they have to an independent part of the US government to do an investigation, testify before Congress, explain this sabotage, because that's what it is, it's sabotage. Um, so here are my suggestions, and I'll put these up online, but right now we're spending about a billion dollars a year on offensive cyber operations. Raise your hand if you know of anybody working on defensive crypto research that gets a billion dollars. I didn't think so, great. So we should actually work on defensive work. We should work on censorship resistance because someday all of the things that we want will be censored somewhere. How will we build an internet that stops that, right? I mean, I'm obviously, um, I'm a little biased here, but I think we need help with things like Tor. We have been able to resist a lot of NSA attack. That is, they haven't been able to break the Tor network. It's an open area of research. They're actually behind the open research community, which is slightly embarrassing to them as from what we can tell. Um, but an important point is, we need everybody to work together for this. If we want free speech, we've got to have it. None of us are free until all of us are free of network distinguishers. It's really important, right? Mass surveillance works by selector. And when we have weakened protocols, these guys, but not just these guys, exploit it. Um, these are also very important. So, I'm, I mean, I have a little conflict of interest here with Dan um, because we have some work together. Um, but the main thing is that, you know, a lot of people just don't implement anything. They just do not implement what they're talking about. So they don't realize that it's not free software, so someone will do it wrong, and they haven't seen an example, or uh, it's not actually resistant against modern CPU implementation errors or anything along those lines. So realistically, we need to think about this. We need to think about making sure that it, a crypto thing that we want to standardize on, there's a free software implementation. It runs on modern architectures. We've considered questions of side channel attacks. We don't just rule them out because it is actually going to be deployed. So how will we build these things? And of course, we have to consider this, the long haul program. This is a massive supercomputing uh, program, two facilities uh, chained together with a thing called Island Transport. We disclosed this in December as well. Um, that is two supercomputers that are crazy powerful. I encourage you to read the documents online, but there is one in Oak Ridge, uh, 
and there's one at Fort Meade, and there will be more. There's also what's called a mission data repository or uh, a sort of a massive data repository in Bluffdale, Utah, but there are several others that are out there. This is, you know, storing data for 100 years, right? It's the 100-year crypto problem, only they're solving the how to store your crypto for 100 years, which is going to outlist most of the crypto things that you have chosen. Um, so which with, you know, with that, we need free software so we can audit it. We need open and free hardware so that when we run it somewhere, we have some notion that we don't have a CPU backdoor. I mean, there's a small number of companies in the world that control your ability to compute. And for a nation state, they call that a supply chain issue. Well, the NSA is backdooring the supply chain for everybody. That's really problematic. I bet the Chinese and the Russians are doing it too. I bet a lot of people are doing it. And that is really scary stuff. Um, but the key thing is a social thing. When everybody here refuses to backdoor or so-called front door these systems, it changes the game. It actually moves the issue to another area. So if they can't get the software community and the business community to backdoor it, they're gonna move to the hardware people. So you gotta reach everybody, unfortunately. But it's important to consider that. Um, and yeah, and realistic threat models about money are, of course, important. Um, I put this up here as an example because I think a lot of people think that getting rid of secret surveillance is impossible, like on a mass scale. But I actually believe that if you look at, for example, the SOFAR channel, I believe it's what it's called, where the United Nations monitors for atomic bomb testing underwater, that's fully specified open transparent surveillance that is a mass surveillance. They also do spectrum uh, analysis of the air to see if someone has done a detonation above ground. Those two programs for surveillance are an example of how if someone's going to explode an atomic bomb of some kind, they're going to be caught. You will detect that it has a happen that it has happened. And it's completely open and specified. You don't need secrecy for that. In fact, the fact that it isn't a secret, the fact that it is being done helps to deter people from doing those things and thinking that they can get away with it. So we can actually get rid of secret surveillance. We can make it so that a lawful authority, if they want to do interception, has to assert they are the lawful authority. Because what's the difference between the FBI wiretapping one of you guys, for example, and the Chinese government doing it? How do you tell the difference? Which court do you go to for redress? So we have to get rid of this notion of secret surveillance. And people will say, well, that will change a criminal's behavior. And an important point is, yes, it will. But so does mass surveillance. It has a chilling effect. So. People used to think it was impossible to get rid of landmines, but we have a huge international campaign about that. And the reason is because it's just fundamentally, landmines are incompatible with a whole bunch of things that we care about as human values. I think secret surveillance and mass surveillance is exactly that. We should not make it so that we have vulnerabilities in systems which are kept by one set of people who are supposed to be fixed by another set of people. That contradiction undermines the very basis of a liberal democracy because you can't trust the institutions anymore. Um, so if either of those seem impossible to you, you know, they're hard. They're really hard. Um, and so in, you know, in the 40s and 50s, if you look at someone like Feynman, you, you know that they had a really strong voice. At some point, Feynman, after he built the atomic bomb, he obviously didn't do it by himself, but after he built the atomic bomb, he was refining, I believe he says, and surely you must be joking, Mr. Feynman, he explains that he did it because he wanted to make sure that the Germans during the Second World War wouldn't win, that they wouldn't get it first. And so he won. And at some point he realized that, that America had won the war and they'd even used the bomb. And so he should stop refining them and he should go back to, I believe it was Caltech, and go do something else. And so a really interesting point here is we did a lot of this sabotage as a country, the United States, I think, because we had an attack. We had 9-11. Now we need to recognize that for the most part, we've neutralized that concern. I mean, it's just not proportional as a response. And the, the downsides of continuing on that path are unbelievable. They're immeasurable at the moment. But from an economic perspective, just looking at fighter jets alone, the US lost a fighter jet contract of billions of dollars to Boeing to Saab in Sweden for the Brazilian government because of the spying, wiretapping Dilma Rousseff. The same thing is happening all over the place in all sorts of different companies. So the economic measure, even if you don't care about human rights, which is despicable, but if you only care about the economic measure, you see that that is, of course, a measurable, serious downside. So even the most cold-hearted capitalist bastards should recognize these are the wrong choices. Um, so the question, I suppose, which is a little guilty, and I'm sorry, but if you've got children, what do you suppose you're going to tell them in 20 years? Right? Well, yeah, I helped do mass surveillance. Or, no, I helped build systems against mass surveillance. I helped secure us. I helped establish that there was objective truths in standards bodies, and we could believe in them. Um, so 
the full cycle here about surveillance, and I'm almost finished. When we fail to build privacy-preserving telephone systems, we actually accidentally have an emergent system for targeting people for drone strikes. So there are people in Pakistan, in the Wazari region of Pakistan, children who have no tie at all to terrorism, who get killed by drone strikes and preemptively declared as terrorists because they happen to be Muslim children of so-called combatant age, that is 11 or 12 and above. And in some cases, they're even American citizens, which to me shouldn't make a difference, but it should to the Americans in the audience, that the President of the United States actually assassinates, which is illegal, people who are US citizens without a trial. In some cases, they say, oh, it's an accident. It's the so-called collateral damage, which is a really like degrading, inhuman term. But the most important part to understand is the way this has happened. It's not that they plan to build tracking devices for the whole planet. It's that they exploit the vulnerabilities. We have to plan to build liberty into these systems, privacy-preserving features into them, or they will be exploited. Right now, we have a drone advantage. We will not always have a drone advantage in the United States. So we really have to be forward thinking about this. Um, I think that that's a very straightforward thing, but the point is that privacy failures directly connect with the American assassination programs. So it's not like a disconnected thing in any way. There's a direct connection between these things. And for our drone programs alone, it's thousands of people of which zero of them have had a trial. So whatever crime they have committed, which is probably the case, the fair trial standards do not apply and they're being assassinated. So there may be some evil of some kind, some great wronging, but we are also committing a great wrong in that. So I think what needs to be done is we have to change that world entirely. Um, so, you know, I wanna leave you with this thought and then take uh, questions if there's any time, but Chelsea Manning, Thomas Drake, Jesslyn Raddick, William Binney, Mark Klein, J. Kirk Wiebe, Edward Snowden, Daniel Ellsberg, these are, in my opinion, some of the greatest Americans to ever live because they told us the truth at a time when people were telling us a great deal of lies. They exposed major crimes. Now, people have said they've committed crimes, and I think it's probably true. Bill Binney says it best. He says, I'm happy to be prosecuted for talking about classified programs, but I'd like to make sure the people that broke the law first, they go first into those trials. So let's make sure about that. And we see, for example, with Petraeus, who gave his girlfriend, he was the director of the CIA, we see that he gave his girlfriend classified material for a book about his life. And he is basically gonna walk with no jail time at all for disclosing massive amounts of classified information. So there's a two-tier justice system. Chelsea Manning is in prison for 35 years for a much more irrelevant set of data in a sense about a thing which has passed, like historical things that were like 40 years ago. They're still historically relevant, they're still extremely important, but there's a huge difference between those two, especially about classification levels. And there's something to be said about the fact that that two-tier justice system undermines also the liberal democracy in the US. So if you work at the NSA, and I know several of you do, if you work in the CIA, if you work at NIST, if you work at these organizations, I really encourage you to be the next Daniel Ellsberg to be the next Edward Snowden, to blow the whistle about these things and to help build secure systems and to find the people that are harming the open research community, that are harming the scientific community and essentially to neutralize them by truth telling, with transparency, with open standards, with scientific process and refusing to dignify things like 80-bit keys and ciphers, for example, and backdoor random number generators or things that can't be verified and making sure that we actually take those steps. Um, so that was your... Uh, that was your invited keynote for me, and I'm happy to take any questions as long as there's a microphone to pass around so we can all hear the questions. Exactly. Yeah. Huh? yeah, I think there's still some. I mean, if you are not terribly hungry, then we could still take some questions. So, uh, any questions for Jacob? None? Oh, yeah, I've got one. NSA people get priority. So I find that one of the big problems is uh, public awareness. Uh, in order to really change anything, we need the public to be aware that we have a problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, often I find myself talking with, with people about this, and all the time I get this, I have nothing to hide argument. Mm -hmm. And uh, one, I, I can't find an easy way to counter this. You say you come here with clothes today, which is true. Um, but then I would counter that by saying, well, yeah, 
because I don't want to show my naked body in public. But if I go to the doctor, I take it off. Yeah, you choose. And so that. you may. So you may. I choose to take it. But yeah. You also choose to go to the doctor. You also, by the way, have a society that ensures that you have a doctor. Congratulations on that. <laughs> uh, but so many people may say, well, the police is considered. I mean, the police are the intelligence services. They are kind of. Uh, they are not the public. They, I don't open up to public. It's it's for my protection, right? So, do you have any other ways uh, to counter this uh, argument? Yeah, I mean, I think there are, I mean, there are two types of people you're talking with, right? One kind of person is kind of in, a, let's say, in shock. I mean, this is like a lot of bad news, by the way. I'm really sorry to give you this bad news. Um, this is a lot of bad news, in my opinion. And so you just have to, I think, recognize that there's a conversation that's stopping there and just to ask them to explain how they feel about it, to talk about it, if you really want to. It doesn't scale for social change to, to do that. We have to change through cultural institutions, I think. So the movie Citizen Four, has anyone heard of this? It's a film, it's a documentary film about Edward Snowden produced by Laura Poitras. I'm in it, I helped to make it. We just won an Oscar last week uh, for it, which is important. I think just getting people to sit down and watch that movie helps them to get past that point. Because the question is not, do you have anything to hide necessarily as the ending of the conversation? The, the next question is, how does that make you feel? What kind of world do you want to live in? Is this the process by which we should arrive there? I mean, those things are helpful. And of course, this, this notion that we don't have to worry about the police and the intelligence services, I mean, the history of the world suggests otherwise. I mean, when I live in Germany now, which is very weird. I live in exile in Berlin. I haven't been to the US in two years because of really serious US government harassment. Um, you know, and when I talk with Germans about this, they're like, your life reminds me of people from the past, what you are dealing with right now. And it's very, it's like very difficult actually to get people to understand that and to relate to that. Um, and at the same time, it's very clear to people who have previous experience how history has a, a tendency uh, to be forgotten and that people believe themselves to be exceptions, right? Americans, I asked General Alexander a lot of questions. One of the questions which someone asked him that wasn't me, which I thought was brilliant, um, this German stood up and he had a poster for a company called Deutsche Homag. Some of you have heard of this. It was IBM, a subsidiary during the Second World War who sold mass surveillance solutions. And the mass surveillance solution was a punch card system. And this is documented by Edwin Black in the book IBM and the Holocaust, which I think is the best book ever written about surveillance, actually. Although people might not think of it that way. It's actually about like punch card machines and, you know, IBM. But um, he stood up and he said, you know, I've got this poster for you, this IBM poster. Uh, and I just wonder, can you tell us, you know, what happens when somebody comes after you? Like the next set of people that control these systems. Let's say you're perfectly good. And I actually think General Alexander, personally, is probably a really cool guy. I know people that work with him. They're like, yeah, Jenny, he's really cool. He's a really great guy. Super nice. He really cares about, you know, people. He doesn't want to hurt anybody. Never mind the fact that he's like, you know, a war criminal. But, you know, it's okay. And he actually said that he, during, during this discussion that he was just following orders in Germany, which is like a hilarious side point. Um, but he basically said the scariest thing I've ever heard any of the American government officials say. He said, nobody comes after us. So where in history has a regime lasted forever where data that they collected was never ever misused after the regime changed or when the political party shifted and the regime didn't fall? but the political parties were more powerful. We even see it in American history with J. Edgar Hoover, right? We see in American history that that's the case. So each person, I think, can recognize that if you can get them past that stopping point. Showing them Citizen Four will help them, but also showing them about world history, especially if they're Americans, could probably be very useful, I think. Um, I mean, most people think of the Stasi as a total evil that was totally illegitimate, but actually in the GDR, the Stasi was protecting the state against, for example, the United States, which was, I think, legitimately trying to collapse it, although you sometimes using very illegitimate means. And so there's something to be said about the fact that the security services by some pop part of the population were not as despicable as Americans imagine it to be. And that is also a lesson which when I lived in Germany, I learned. I learned that firsthand by talking to people who, for example, said, you know, if I didn't have that, I wouldn't have been able to go to school. I wouldn't have had medical care. I wouldn't have had opportunities. But then you also meet people who were like, yes, well, my family member tried to cross the wall and they were shot. Or I, you know, lived under this persecution. Showing the range of that shows that there's a range of that now as well. And it's obviously not as bad in some ways, but in terms of data collection and in terms of how it's carried out, 
it could be worse. I mean, less than 200 people were officially killed at the wall. So that means we have an order of magnitude more people killed by drone strikes. How will history reflect on this period of time? I don't think it'll reflect well on it, quite frankly. So, I mean, that's a lot to take in, but we had one question, I think. So, oh, we got two more. Um, is we are actually in the real world. We have LinkedIn, we have email servers, we have Dropbox, we have Google, we have G uh, YouTube, we have Facebook, we have Cloud, we have actually the, the, the en most enemies. We have just keeping installing uh, uh, applications in Linux or in Windows. We are watching movies online. So we are actually in the real world. Mm -hmm. And thinking all of this, uh, I cannot do anything else. I think there's a lot to be done. I mean, uh, don't, so if you just want to talk about it in terms of like capitalistic market solutions, don't use Dropbox. They wanted to be a prison partner and they have Condoleezza Rice, who I think is also a war criminal, uh, on their board. Why would you use a product that's like CIA file storage? I mean, it's, this is crazy. So use something like Tahoe Laughs, which is designed by Zuko, one of the great cypherpunks that's alive right now. Look at, for example, Spider Oak, which is designed to use key stretching and actual user stored keys to store only ciphertext. So you get provider independent security, which is a very useful security property. Using systems like that, using systems like Signal, it's true, if you are targeted by an intelligence service, you're gonna have a lot of trouble, but you can actually make different decisions right now that change actually the realistic likelihood of you being targeted by those intelligence services, right? If you're in Iraq and you go to a gay dating website, you got problems and like serious ones that are life-threatening probably. Same is true in Iran, right? And there's lots of things that are, that are in my opinion, that are, that are like that. And so it is overwhelming, but the main thing is just simply maintain in your heart of hearts that that is not the world you want to live in. And then in each of these actions to do something to change that, just little bits at a time. And if all of us do little things, especially in the crypto community, they have huge ripple effects that are very useful. When you guys standardized AES, you really screwed up a lot of spies days. It's really important to note that. There are not many communities that can say that, but when, when Rogaway helps to design you know, some of the crypto constructions that he has, he really helps to secure and to help everybody on the planet. And that's very impressive. So don't, don't give up hope. It dies last, but it still dies. Hi, um, the title of your talk is Conflicting Roles. Um, I didn't uh, really see any, well, my question is, do you, uh, do you see any worth in the existence of the NSA? I know there are many people who just think it should be defunded and made to go away. Do you feel that way, or do you feel that there is positive to any part of its mission? Yeah, maybe you um, should. Maybe you should uh, yes. Um, you work I, at NSA. I work at NSA. I already knew that. You and the guy next to you, I know. Um, I have your photos. And I'm one of the designers of uh, Simon Sorry. Speck. I, I know. work at InfoSec. Yeah. Uh, no, but seriously. Um, so are you part of the IED division? Um, I'm in research. Yes. Which, under which, which directorate? Research directorate. OK. Um, but no, it's a, a serious question. Do you, do you see any? value in the mission, any parts of the NSA mission, or do you think it should be defunded? Um, I think it, that, that question is a really great question. First of all, thank you for asking it, because that's a really brave thing after I just like sort of laid into the NSA for an hour. Respect. If you have any documents you'd like to leak me, I'm here all day. <laughs> um, uh, but in all, in all seriousness, um, I think the question is the wrong question. I think that the research people who are doing positive beneficial research, not just attacking indigenous crypto systems, for example, I think that those people do have a job that is very important. And I think that it is critical that the information assurance parts and the research parts that are doing actual defensive work, that is not building back doors, not breaking into systems, but actually securing systems, that should be a separate agency entirely. And if you wanna call it the NSA, sounds great. I think the brand's trashed, maybe call it something else, like IAD, for example, as its own agency. Those people should have a billion dollars in funding. They should be able to do kleptographic research, but not implement it. I think that there is a role for the other side of the NSA, but I think it's so out of whack right now that it's ridiculous. The CIA is doing the same thing. The Defense Intelligence Agency is doing the same thing. The Air Force is doing the same thing, the Navy, the Army. You've got all these people that are all engaged in this sort of like fifth domain of warfare. And I think that the defensive, the actually defensive parts are tainted by being tied together with that. 
And I think that that shames, unfortunately, you directly. Like Simon and Speck should not even be reviewed by anyone in the community because it dignifies and wastes the cycles, the brain cycles of really intelligent people by going to look at a thing that is produced by a bad actor agency, not to say you're a bad actor. And you guys were always ahead of the game. You knew about differential cryptanalysis before anybody else in public, in the academic world did. You know, that to me suggests that you know something else and you're not telling us that and we're not going to find it immediately and it's difficult to discover from first principles. And you have a clearance. I'm certain of it. Probably TSSCI for some interesting stuff, right? So, I mean, you can't talk about that, but I'm sorry for even asking. But, <laughs> but, but, but that's the problem. The work you do, if you are honest and good and true and trying to secure us, is fundamentally sabotaged by this. And so, for example, if you're not thrilled about all the stuff Snowden released, it makes me also question what's going on. Because what he's shown is this massive sabotage and this incre in incredible series of deceptive practices, which ultimately I think are harmful not only to the world, but to America, to our economy, to our reputation. I write free software for freedom. I write things as part of the Tor network and other tools. And because I'm an American, I get a lot of shit because of the NSA. People say, why should we trust it? Obviously it's a honey trap, it's a back door and so on. And so I think you should quit your job and go and work at a reputable place and stop lending your reputation to it. And then we should look at the things that you're doing. And hopefully you're not an infiltrator, right? Because there are also those people in private companies. That's in the black budget. Millions of dollars to do that kind of social influence with CIA. I'm sorry if that is a depressing answer, but I really, and the worst part about, the worst part about it is that, like, if you are totally innocent, you are collateral damage for their plan. I'm, I'm really sorry about that. And I don't want to live in a world where good Americans that are doing good crypto research get tainted like that. The way I've been tainted because I'm an American alone. That really, it bugs me. Like I know other people from NSA, like Charlie Miller, they actually are from the offensive tailored access operations side. He is. I actually think he's a great guy. I'm really glad he quit the NSA and went and worked somewhere else. And he's doing interesting research outside of that place. And there are lots of other people that are like that. And so you can be Edward Snowden 2.0. I believe in you. Does the other guy from NSA have a question? No? All right. CIA? Anybody from the CIA? <laughs> Don't drone me, bro. <laughs> yeah. Um, hi, I have a question about um, TrueCrypt. It's one of the tools that is on the top right of that picture. I have attempted to use TrueCrypt in, the, in like the last couple months, and I, I haven't for a long time. And I noticed that the version, the latest version is like this weird thing that tells you that they don't like, that they believe that there's a security problem, et cetera, et cetera. Can you comment on that uh, uh, as someone who uses yeah, tools? Yeah, so I mean, I don't really use TrueCrypt um, for licensing reasons and so on, but we use it a lot for a lot of the Snowden related disclosure stuff. And I fundamentally think that TrueCrypt causes a lot of problems for these agencies, but you gotta have it on a Windows machine in some cases, or you, you can use it on Tails and other, operating systems, obviously, but fundamentally there's like this whole integrated operational security thing you have to think about because when working on these kinds of issues, you have to deal with ridiculous security constraints you can't even imagine. Um, you know, like a backpack you never leave behind. Um, it's really in, yeah, eating USB disks, that kind of stuff. So um, I think that if you're worried about it, you have to sort of scope it out. The safety planning is what they call it in domestic violence or in the security world, you call it threat modeling. And you have to decide. I mean, TrueCrypt, I think crypto-wise is fine. And I think there's an audit that is being undertaken right now by Matt Green, which um, will probably not find major problems with it. Um, but there's, of course, lots of funny little details. Like if you put a TrueCrypt volume on a Dropbox, what happens if an attacker changes the TrueCrypt volume to something that's malformed? Like maybe the crypto is no problem, but maybe you just typed in your passphrase and now they can decrypt the thing they pulled off the server. Right? So we have to like have this multifaceted approach to that. So TrueCrypt itself, crypto is probably fine. From what I can tell, they haven't been able to break it. I could be totally wrong about that, but I've seen no evidence of that. I've seen evidence of them breaking a lot of other stuff. Um, for example, there was a report from The Intercept yesterday where they're talking about breaking all sorts of stuff like... Uh, uh, BitLocker and attacking Apple systems and so on. And it, I would, I'm not going to summarize that, but just as an example, they're really sabotaging more of these crypto systems, American ones in that case, which is crazy to me. Um, and so TrueCrypt, I think, falls under this sort of category. I would suggest 
using a fully free software operating system, which has deterministic builds. So Debian is working on that process uh, and using DMcrypt, which is built into the Linux kernel and not using the Intel random number generator, the hardware random number generator. Because if I were the US government and I was gonna backdoor one single piece of hardware, one on the planet, it would be the Intel random number generator, without a doubt. It would give you the world. I mean, AMD, I'm sure they've got a random number generator, but zero people use their computers, so it is irrelevant. Um, but if you're using the Intel random number generator and you use TrueCrypt, what do you have? I mean, all the crypto falls apart when you have no entropy. Any other questions? I'm standing between you and lunch, so I'm super sorry. Uh oh, there's somebody else. I also have a question if we have the time, by the way. Do you think the IACR should thank Edward Snowden? Yes, I think the IACR should not only thank Edward Snowden, they should request that the Obama administration gives him clemency because I think that the IACR is in the interest of the open research community, for sure. And I think it's really important to do that. And I, I guess I'm a member, that's what I heard uh, next year. So as a member next year, I'd just like to say that I really hope the IACR will thank and write an open statement to Edward Snowden and call on Congress for an independent investigation and the parliaments of the world for that. And I think that's important. I think Phil Rogaway is one of the main people in the crypto community who really wants everyone in the crypto community to be politically active and involved on these issues to like sort of wake up to the importance. We need real scientific advisors that are engaged. And so that kind of open letter calling, you know, to thank Edward Snowden and to request clemency is very powerful and means a lot. And his life is at stake. That dude should not be stuck in Russia. It's a serious shame. It's a real shame in a lot of ways. I'm sure he's having a great time, you know, but I wouldn't want to be stuck there. And uh, if you can do something to change that, to get that IACR to write that letter, please do it. I really hope you will. Get the NSA to sign on too. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. It was great.